Gold a bright, slightly orange-yellow, soft and malleable metal. Well, soft and malleable when compared to other metals like iron, you can't really feel it as soft in your hands. 24 karat gold usually contains just a touch of copper to precisely keep you from being able to bend it. Gold has been, throughout human history, used as a precious metal, first as a form of currency itself and then as a guarantee of the value of currency. The reason why humans chose gold to serve these purposes was in part an arbitrary choice. Proof of that is the fact we also have used silver and bronze or copper throughout time. But gold has always been the precious metal. A good example of that is the fact that in sports events, gold is used for the first place medals, silver for the second, and bronze for the third, somewhat of a ranking of the precious metals themselves. However, the reason gold is valuable is not only arbitrary, and also directly related to its properties, one of which being the fact that there is a limited amount of it, and it's not very common. There are other metals, both more common and more rare, but both would present further issues. If, for instance, iron was used, you would end up having to carry some very big coins. If it were to match its real value, there's just too much of it around. With all the noble metals, except silver and gold, you have the opposite problem. They are so rare that you would have to cast some very tiny coins, which you might easily lose. These other noble metals are also very hard to extract and their melting point is very high. In platinum, for instance, it is 1768 degrees Celsius, while gold and silver also have a relatively low melting point and are therefore easy to turn into coins, ingots, or jewelry. To sum up, gold is valuable and chosen as the main metal to represent wealth because it allows for a durable storage of wealth it doesn't corrode. Among the rare metals, it's not super rare and it is easy to extract. It's easily portable, having significant value per gram. It's easily divisible, being formed into whatever size is preferable, and it's difficult to counterfeit. Because of this, it has been the choice of states throughout history to keep gold in their coffers. Like I mentioned, first as currency itself with gold coins and then as a guarantee of other forms of currency. The gold standard was the basis for the international monetary system from the 1870s until 1971. That year, the United States unilaterally ended the convertibility of the US dollar to gold. But regardless, many states still hold substantial gold reserves. So why? A gold reserve is held by a national central bank intended mainly as a guarantee to redeem promises to pay depositors, note holders like paper money, or trading partners, and also as a store of value or to support the value of the national currency. This is because the price of gold increases in response to events that cause the value of paper investments such as stocks and bonds to decline. It's essentially a guarantee. Although the price of gold can be volatile in the short term, it has always maintained its value over the long term. So understanding why gold is valuable and why states build up reserves of it, in this video we're going to take a look at the countries in the world that have the largest gold reserves today, especially focusing on how they acquired so much of it. We are going to list and mention a few interesting cases among the top 20 countries. So let's start with the list. Here are the countries with the largest gold reserves in the world in metric tons. First the United States, then Germany, Italy, France, Russia, China, Switzerland, Japan, India, Turkey, the Netherlands, Taiwan, Portugal, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, the United Kingdom, Lebanon, Spain, Austria, and Thailand. The International Monetary Fund, if counted on this list, would rank third, having a reserve of 2,815 tons. The European Central Bank would also rank 12th with 500 tons. Before we move on with the video, a quick message from today's sponsor, Wondrium. Wondrium is the premier service for people who love to learn, presenting you with hundreds of high-level courses about several topics. These are documentaries, series, how-to videos, tutorials, and spending over 6,000 hours of content, which is thoroughly researched and entertaining. They describe themselves as a service that enriches your overall life experiences with approachable, comprehensive, and illuminating content. I love to watch things like these, I feel like through a video, especially a good one, you can learn so much more and do it in such an easy way. I've been watching a great documentary about the US Constitution through the ages. It's really interesting. For instance, did you know that the early constitutions for each US state were actually very different in the styles of government that they had? I had no idea about this. If you have something you really want to learn about, odds are Wondrium has it and is the best place to learn about it. And if they don't, they add new content every month. And 
and they're giving my viewers a great offer of a free trial. So thank you to Wondrium for sponsoring today's video. Sign up now through the link in the description. Now back to the video. So how did these countries get so much gold? Well, there are only a few options. During most of history, a nation's gold reserves were considered its key financial assets and a major prize of war, where compensation resulting from military victories are one way of obtaining gold, taking it from another nation. One really cool example related to this is during World War II, when the Belgian government transferred one third of its gold reserves to the UK, another third to Canada and the US, and the rest to France, to avoid it being captured by the invading Germans. France itself, as soon as the war started going against them, sent almost all its gold to Senegal, then a part of the French colonial empire. One other way of obtaining gold is producing it, either by direct control of the mines or by extracting it somewhere else. This somewhere else might be an autonomous nation that licensed extraction or a colonial possession. Portugal and Spain obtained much of their gold from South America during the time when they ruled it through their colonial empires. The same happened with the United Kingdom in Africa and Asia. In fact, a lot of the gold held by European countries came from somewhere else in the world. And finally, countries can buy gold, exchanging their currency or services or products for the metal itself. In 2009, for instance, India's central bank bought 200 metric tons of gold from the IMF. And in 2011, Mexico purchased nearly 100 tons of gold as well. So now let's take a look at a few of these countries on the list, the ones that I found to be most interesting, and which teach us something interesting about gold reserves in general. First, the United States. The US's gold reserve is interesting, and this chart we can see it compared to the value of the metal. It had a great increase during the times of the gold standard, then decreasing and now being leveled for some decades. But the US aren't the only country to have decreased their gold reserves. This chart shows us that evolution. Out of the main gold holders between 1993 and 2014, only a handful of countries increased their reserve. 56% of US gold is held at the famous Fort Knox, and most of it came from gold imports. 5,400 tons came from foreign mines, mostly from South Africa, 2,700 from foreign central banks, mostly France and the UK. Only 800 metric tons are from domestic production. This teaches us that gold accumulation varies throughout time depending on policy and current local or international events. This chart showing gold reserves in Switzerland makes that evident, with a huge peak beginning during World War II, rising with the gold standard practice and then stabilizing and even decreasing. Another interesting case is Germany. According to its gold storage plan, the Bundesbank has been storing half of Germany's gold reserves in its own vaults in Frankfurt am Main. Oddly, a lot of it was before stored in New York, London, and Paris, up to 300 tons in each foreign location. 70% of German gold was stored abroad until 2015, something that is apparently common. 50% is held in Austria while 20% is in Switzerland and the remaining 30% in London. This seems to be a way to diversify risk in its storage, but there is also an added risk that you won't be able to get it if your country suddenly doesn't get along with the one where the gold is stored. For instance, in 2018, the Bank of England refused the withdrawal of 14 tons of gold owned by the Central Bank of Venezuela. Regarding the German gold in the US, it was acquired by West Germany during a period of trade surpluses with the US before 1970. The gold had never been repatriated to Germany due to fear of invasion by the Soviet Union. Once that threat disappeared, they brought it back to Germany. This teaches us that often a country's gold isn't stored in the country itself. China's gold reserves are listed as under 2,000 metric tons, but some reports point to their storage being much larger. China's gold mining is a significant factor. In 2007, they overtook South Africa as the world's largest producer. This past decade, it has produced about 15% of all the gold mined in the world. It's an interesting statistic, the fact that the world's biggest gold mining countries aren't necessarily the ones with the biggest reserves. The top 12 producing gold countries in order are China, Australia, Russia, the US, Canada, Ghana, Mexico, South Africa, Uzbekistan, Indonesia, Sudan, and Peru. Only four of these are in the top 20 reserves. Turkey isn't in the world's top producers, but it does mine gold and keeps a good amount itself, making it one of the world's largest holders. This shows us that gold doesn't usually stay where it is mined, being instead sold to other countries, and that some nations might in fact have larger reserves than they say. One country that stood out to me from this list was Lebanon, a country that has apparently been facing serious financial troubles over the past years. 
So how does it have one of the world's biggest gold reserves at the same time? Lebanon reportedly bought its gold by selling its French currency reserves that they had since colonial times, two-thirds of which is stored in Fort Knox in the US, by the way. In 1986, the Lebanese currency was devaluing very quickly. Many feared that the gold would be sold in the pretense of slowing or stopping the economic crisis. It was therefore decided that legislation was to be created, making it very difficult to sell the country's gold. Reason why today, even facing another crisis, they still seem to hold on to it. This teaches us that gold has limited uses as well. If it can't be used in the most dire of moments, then should a country really bother to have it? One more country that stood out to me is my own, Portugal, which has the world's 13th largest gold reserves. And it also didn't sell its gold during the 2011 international financial crisis. The reason why is also a law which states that any proceeds from gold sales cannot be transferred to the state treasury. One other interesting aspect about Portuguese gold is its origin. Throughout history, the Portuguese kingdom got a lot of gold from its colonial empire in Africa, Asia, and mostly South America. However, Portugal acquired gold through trade as well. In the 20th century, the Portuguese dictatorial government sold shipments of Wolfram, a mineral, to the Third Reich. In exchange, they received German gold. This has been an issue the country has faced, with some calls for the gold to be returned to those who the Germans stole it from. And finally for this video, one more example is Taiwan. I found an article called Taiwan's Love Affair with Gold. According to it, the reason why Taiwan has so much gold is the effort to stabilize their economy after World War II, along with Taiwan's enormous trade surplus with the US in the 1980s. Fearing defeat in the mainland, the Republic of China started shipping its gold to Taiwan. When they escaped there as the communists won in the mainland, the gold reserves were used to stabilize the island's economy as it attempted to remain independent. Essentially, it seems Taiwan's gold reserves today come in part from the mainland's historic reserves. Maybe one more reason why China wants to take over. So, that is why gold is valuable and stored by countries, the countries that produce the most of it, how others acquire it, and the list of those which hold the largest amounts of it today. Also understanding some of the strange characteristics of this, like the fact that gold is sometimes stored abroad. Some criticize the storage of gold by stating that it does not contribute to anything but the amassing of wealth, not allowing, for instance, for the creation of additional wealth. While other critics point to examples like Lebanon or Portugal, when holding large gold reserves didn't help the fight against a financial crisis. But the reality seems to be that throughout history, during the most trialing times, gold has remained a constant of security and stability for the world's financial and banking systems. What do you think? Should countries try to store as much gold as they can, or should they invest their wealth instead of buying gold with it? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching this video, subscribe if you want, and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.